So good evening, everybody, uh, students, and uh, all uh, our listeners who have joined in today for this session. So welcome to this uh, second week of our um, online course, online certificate course on the Renaissance. And today we are very proud and fortunate to have amongst us Professor Nandini Sahu. Professor Nandini Sahu is a major voice in English literature as both creator and critic. She has accomplished her doctorate in English literature under the guidance of late Professor Niranjan Mohanty, Professor of English, Vishwabharati Shantiniketan. She has been widely published in India, US, UK, Africa, Pakistan. And apart from numerous other literary awards that she holds, she is a triple gold medalist in English literature. She has received the gold medal from the Honorable Vice President of India for her contributions to English studies in the year 2019. She's the author and editor of 14 books, uh, of several poetry collections. There are so many students who are working on her um, works. And we are very glad that she is here to introduce a very important segment of the Renaissance to you. And most importantly, we appreciate her commitment to this lecture. She has been suffering from COVID and she has not been keeping her usually strong self. But we wish her all the best and we are very thankful that she could make it despite all this. Thank you so much, Nandini Ma'am, for being with us. And over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vasudha. And uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Yahya. Yes, I'm, I am so committed. Uh, he invited me and I said yes to him, so I am here. Uh, I'm recovering from COVID and uh, I'm, I will try to uh, to uh, do my best today. And, and in between, I may take a couple of uh, one or two minutes short breaks because I need to take my medicines, I need to take water, so I might be taking some small breaks. And uh, thank you, uh, your university, your college, for giving me this opportunity to talk to the students about uh, this important subject. I understand that uh, this lecture series is going very well, and the uh, students are enthusiastically participating. And uh, I understand that a lot of discussion is going on, and a lot of you know uh, the students are being benefited from this lecture series. And uh, I will try to contribute in my small little way to to this lecture series about uh, Renaissance. Uh, you have uh, actually covered so many uh, topics on the, uh, the umbrella term Renaissance. I was looking at all the lectures and all the eminent speakers that uh, you have uh, invited over the past few days and coming few days also. So many other important lectures are waiting for the students. So uh, my lecture will be full of information. So I would suggest the students to take a pen and paper to take down important points and then to correspond with me via email. Uh, in future, if at all, uh, they want to discuss about uh, the Renaissance art. And today, my theoretical framework will be a new historicism. As a new historicist, as a theorist, as a new historicist, I would try to uh, compare uh, or maybe do a parallel reading of uh, uh, Renaissance literature and, uh, and Renaissance art and how both the subjects I mean, both the phenomena have been uh, influential factors for each other. How Renaissance art has influenced literature of Renaissance and also contemporary literature, and how uh, Renaissance literature has supplemented, has uh, you know, contributed to the making of Renaissance art. I would be uh, trying to cover that as my subject. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible, ma'am. You are audible, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, students already know uh, what do we understand by the Renaissance, known as the Renaissance. It's a period immediately following the Middle Ages in Europe, isn't it? And uh, it is a great revival of interest in the classical learning and the values of ancient Greece and Rome that the previous speakers, yesterday's speaker, I was just uh, trying to listen a little bit. Uh, they, uh, they had talked about uh, uh, the revival of interest in the classical learning and the values of ancient Greece and Rome. And uh, against a backdrop of political stability and growing prosperity uh, and uh, the development of the new technologies and the introduction of the printing press, a new system of astronomy, discovery and exploration of new continents, and uh, uh, you know, importance, a lot of emphasis being given to philosophy, literature, and especially art. The style, new styles of painting, uh, sculpture, decorative arts, 
these things are identified with the idea of Redunza that emerged in Italy in the late 14th century. Now, and this has been already discussed with the students and how it reached its its climax in the late 15th and early 16th centuries in the works of uh, the great masters like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and uh, you know the, the expression of the classical Greek Roman traditions and uh, the search for individualism. So my research points today, I mean my points of discussion today would be uh, the search for individualism, which was a part of the common string attaching Renunza art, painting and literature. Then as a comparatist, I would be comparing the technical nuances introduced by Leonardo da Vinci and Chaucer so go back to Chaucer, to the 14th century, the ideas that Chaucer had introduced, how those ideas slowly came to the Renunza and it found, the ideas, they found a place in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the art of Leonardo da Vinci, that would also be one of my points of discussion. Both Leonardo da Vinci and Chaucer, they were undisputed masters of their crafts. We agree to that, isn't it? Uh, while Leonardo da Vinci introduced the use of uh, the 3D color kind, it's called aerial, the 3D colors kind of uh, thing of perspective with, uh, in art, in painting, it represented the depth and distance of objects by using color. That was the new idea in painting that Leonardo da Vinci introduced. And Chaucer introduced Midland dialect as the new normal in English literature. So both of them had some kind of innovative ideas. Chaucer introduced the Midland dialect and Leonardo da Vinci he introduced the aerial colors, the 3D color sort of thing into art. And Chaucer is credited with many technical advancements like introduction of the rhyme royal. It's a unique, it's unique to his rhyme writing. For the students, I would make it clear that uh, rhyme royal is a rhyming stanza form that was introduced to English poetry by Geoffrey Chaucer and it consists of seven lines, usually in iambic pentameter and the rhyme scheme of rhyme royal is A, B, A, B, B, C, C. The students of English literature must have come through this term sometime or other and uh, uh, with the new techniques introduced during this period, the painters, sculptors, they could now claim that their profession required intellectual ability and knowledge. Now, a lot of emphasis was given to the intellectual ability of the artists, the knowledge of the painters, not just literatures, not just writers, but the intellectual ability of the painters was given a lot of importance during this period the period of Leonardo da Vinci, the, the Renunza period, this permitted the claim that they were superior to simple artisans. The artists, the painters, were superior to simple artisans of any other painting. And the painting and the sculpture would be identifying as the liberal arts. So I'm, I'm quoting Whitcomb. Uh, the, the new coin is liberal arts was introduced to the arena of art and literature during Renaissance period. So the point that I try to establish here is that both art and literature in the Renaissance period, they seek to uh, establish the autonomy of the respective crafts, autonomy. Literature was autonomous, art and painting became autonomous. And the craftsmen, the painters, the artisans and the poets, all of them, uh, they became autonomous uh, researchers, autonomous contributors. And many of the new ideas and attitudes that introduced, that marked the Renaissance times were uh, like humanism, human interests, needs and abilities, and the choice of subjects. Now human beings became uh, the choice of the subjects of the Renaissance artists. And, uh, you know, the Renaissance artists, they painted with the hands of Adam and God. This is a quotation uh, that uh, they painted with the hands of Adam and God. Adam, the original man, and God, the creator. They, pre they painted like this, you know. And uh, 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 Renaissance art is divided into two periods. 
so i will once again go to literature uh, but before i go to the comparative or the new historicist interpretation of renaissance art and renaissance literature let me give you a brief introduction or a brief overview about the different periods of uh, renaissance art the early renaissance period was 1400 to 1479 that is the early renaissance art the period of art and the artists uh they try to emulate classical artists focusing on symmetry so the word symmetry is the key point they created symmetry new kind of art and they created the perfect form and this period features uh, artists like giotto macaccio donatello so they are the original or the the first ever artists of the renaissance period and then the next the second period is high renaissance which is 1475 to 1525 i would repeat the high renaissance period was 1475 to 1525 and uh, during this period uh, the interest was uh, in the perspective the the first period of uh, or the early renaissance period that focused on emulating imitating classical art forms and creating symmetry and the second period uh this gave an uh, rising interest in the artist about the perspective and the space and also on realism so uh, take down one question for your assignments after this uh, lecture uh, because i'm sure that the organizers are, i'm sure that dr yahya has told the students to to do some assignments also so maybe this question can be given to the students that what was the difference uh and the uh, and the approaches of the early renaissance artists and the high renaissance artists so maybe these these points can be discussed with case studies of different artists of both the periods and uh, during the high renaissance period great artists like michelangelo leonardo da vinci and raphael they flourished so this was actually the original or the peak period of the renaissance art and uh, uh subjects started changing uh new subjects were introduced uh into renaissance art the original paintings were about the religious subjects only and uh, slowly they branched out to other subjects so in the early renaissance period the subjects were mostly religious paintings and in the high renaissance period apart from religion religion has always been the background of any kind of painting and art during the renaissance uh but the other subjects were like greek and roman mythology and folklore and historical subjects and uh, portraits of individuals like you know the proper study of mankind is man isn't it and the the fourth subject was details of everyday life so the life of a common man so these things were introduced uh, into renaissance art during uh, the high renaissance period of 1475 to 1525 and uh, also the emotional qualities were introduced this period was again called as the period of realism the period of realism in renaissance art one of the big changes in art was to paint uh, the subject realistically not just surreal but real everyday life the realistic pictures came into existence and uh, it involves a number of techniques so many techniques were introduced uh, like the backgrounds and uh, the colors fruit colors food colors colors of the everyday life they were introduced and uh, new techniques and perspective was introduced into the renaissance painting in the second period or the high renaissance period the perspective became was Uh, you know the perspective was drawing or painting a picture in a way that uh, it looked like it had three dimensions now students even today you talk about three dimensional paintings 3d paintings 3d pictures so this kind of three dimensions or three dimensional pictures paintings were introduced imagine the craftsmanship of those people of the artists these kind of paintings give the illusion that some objects in the painting are further away than others so some of on one canvas some of the objects will look closer as if they are coming forward 
so perspective changed and new techniques were introduced in renaissance art and painting and uh, another thing, technique uh, in the high renaissance period uh, was the balance and proportion drawing subjects of correct size you know balance and then use of light and dark colors artists started using lights and shadows in their work to add some kind of uh, i would say dramatic effect dramatic effect melodramatic effect sometimes even and uh, perspectives and also timing to their art you know if you look at a piece of art due of the renaissance period <laughs> probably you will be in a position to know the timing of that art was it of the original or the the first half of renaissance or did this art belong to the second part of the renaissance the high renaissance period even the timing can be known you know here you can you can look at the poetry of any particular poet or you know the creative writing of any particular writer if you look at the writings of uh, any particular write, writer during the uh, the young age or the early period or the youth of the writer and again you read some piece of the writer during his maturing or matured time matured age then you will see that there is a lot of difference in the approach in the language or maybe in the perspective so this is applicable even to the renaissance art that the use of light and dark adding drama adding new perspective and adding the timing to uh, to the to the pieces of art and uh, you know they introduced another uh, uh, technique which is uh, uh, used by leonardo da vinci uh, it was called fumetto and it was a way of blurring the lines you know unclear lines blurring the lines between the subjects and uh, this technique was particularly used in the painting mona lisa now who doesn't know mona lisa all of you have seen mona lisa paintings and uh, you must have heard that you must have read that it's the most mysterious smile in any painting in the world you do not know the meaning of the smile on mona lisa's lips why why is it so because of this blurring of the lines beside both both means both sides of her lips the lips are very finely painted very nicely very clearly painted but on the both the sides towards the cheek both sides of the cheeks of mona lisa uh, the artist the painter particularly intentionally clear used some kind of blurs some kind of haziness so this technique was introduced uh, by leonardo da vinci during this period and lot of other artists have taken over this kind of uh, you know technique of uh, the, the style of painting uh, towards the last part of my lecture i'll come to uh, a couple of points like how renaissance paintings renaissance art uh, uh, have, they, those have means those paintings have influenced even indian art lot of indian artists painters even today they are using the techniques of renaissance art i will come to that in the last part of my lecture and uh, another new technique uh, of the renaissance art was for shortening and it added perspective and depth to the paintings and for shortening it was a way of shortening lines small small lines shortening the lines to give the illusion of depth as if it's very deep so that foreshortening technique was also used by the renaissance painters and another uh, uh, new idea that is not a technique but a new idea in the renaissance art was humanism it was a big change in the renaissance period about the basic way people thought about lives people thought about themselves with a lot of humanitarian approach a lot of humanism people started thinking about life and literature and uh, in the middle uh, just remember before renaissance in the middle ages life was very tough full of war battles hard work but however uh, around the year 1300 uh, uh, people of florence and italy they started to think about life in a more optimistic and a more you know positive manner very differently 
so uh, they studied you know this is this happened because of revival of the learning revival of the reading habits of the books and they studied the writings and the works of the greeks and the romans and uh, they realized that uh, the earlier civilizations people of the earlier civilizations they had a better life they had a good life a positive life and the now renaissance artists they wanted they tried to introduce that kind of humanism into their life art and literature which you will find truly reflected in the renaissance art and uh, people thought that life could be enjoyable life can be comfortable they started to think that people should be educated art music liberal arts and even sciences were given a lot of importance and liberal arts and sciences were huge for the betterment of human life so this was real change a sea change in the approach of people that uh, arts and sciences can be instrumental in changing the quality of life and uh, now historically speaking uh, after um, uh, after humanism i would give you a little bit of historical background of the period which already we have discussed in your previous lectures but i will slightly touch upon those in the 1400s the medici family came into power in florence they were wealthy bankers and uh, they helped liberal arts by sponsoring artists you know in india also you have seen that our kings our monarchs starting with our ancient kings to the mughal kings and all those monarchs and kings they were also sponsoring many artists if you go to akbar look at akbar and look at the the kind of people he had in his court and how liberal arts poetry and uh, painting and uh, all kinds of fine arts were sponsored were supported by the kings in india similarly the medici family in in the 1400s uh, they supported the humanist movement uh, the name was uh, francisco petrarch it, it's often called the father of humanism he was a scholar and a poet he lived in florence in the 1300s and uh, he studied poets and philosophers from the ancient rome like cicero and virgil he read them his ideas and poetry became an inspiration to many writers and poets throughout renaissance and uh, the first renaissance painter was gitto di bondone he was a painter in florence g i o t t o d i d b o n d o n e so he was from italy he was the first ever painter to break away from the standard byzantine style of painting of the middle ages you know and he introduced some new thing in painting he started painting objects and human beings and in a very realistic manner how they looked uh, before him the artists uh, before giotto di bondo they had more of abstract paintings and uh, those abstract paintings did not look real at all unreal kind of paintings and uh, next was dante he was a major contributor to uh, renaissance art and uh, he lived in florence and he wrote the divine comedy uh, in a previous lecture you have discussed about divine comedy by dante and in the early 1300s and this book was considered to be one of the greatest literary works uh, ever written in the italian language and it has been hugely widely translated and even today we are reading it isn't it in our classrooms we are reading divine comedy so the new ideas that spread and the new thinkings that came into being and the new kind of art that quickly spread to other well the italian city states were like rome venice and milan the early part of the renaissance is called italian renaissance so now you may get a question another question for your assignment <coughs> yes. why the early part of renaissance is called the italian renaissance so this is the reason why these great masters their ideas reading of their texts so italy became a uh, wealthy through trade and commerce new ideas 
were from Italy spread all over Europe. And uh, uh, Donatello, he would later emerge as the master of early Renaissance sculpture, and Macasio. He was also tagged as the founder of Renaissance painting. And these people were from Italy, and you call them the Holy Trinity, T R I N I T Y, the Holy Trinity. Uh, you may get a question. Discuss about the Holy Trinity. Uh, well, the spirit of uh, Renaissance spread all over Italy and into France and then to Northern Europe, to Spain uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Now, we were talking about 13th and 14th centuries. Now, let us go to the 15th and 16th centuries. By the late 1500s, a new style came into Renaissance painting, it was the Mannerist, M-A-N-N-E-R-I-S-T, Mannerist style of painting. And uh, Mannerism is a Mannerist. And you know, its emphasis was on artificiality and uh, it has a contrast to the ideas of Renaissance uh, from Florence and Rome and it became a dominant style in Europe, slowly Mannerist painting or style. After the high renaissance, the next style uh, was Mannerist style and it became famous. So this led to eventual decline of renaissance art. So the Mannerist style was sort of, you know, decadence of the renaissance art. Renaissance art in the high renaissance period with Leonardo da Vinci kind of artists that I just gave you a little bit introduction. Of course, I will go to those in detail. The Mannerist style was totally opposite to that. Its ideas of humanism and naturalism are celebrated. Uh, they continued to be celebrated, but the, the artistic creations of uh, uh, the Mannerist period were a little bit different. And how they were different, I will go to that after I have discussed about the artists in detail. Uh, as I already told you that I will have a new historicist approach, the parallel reading of Renaissance literature and Renaissance art. So I will give you a little bit uh, uh, idea about how Renaissance literature was an instrumental, major instrumental uh, uh, factor in the creation of the Renaissance art. Uh, you all know that Renaissance literature spread in the 14th century Italy. And uh, Dante, Petrarch, and Machiavelli, they are the notable examples of uh, Italian Renaissance writers. Slowly, it went to British literature and other parts about all those, you know, university wits and uh, Spencer and Shakespeare and all. You have already read about them. Uh, from Italy, the influence of the Renaissance spread to different countries and it continued to spread throughout Europe through the 17th century. So now we are covering 14th century Chaucer up to 17th century. A very long period of time we are covering. The English Renaissance and the Renaissance in Scotland uh, from 15th century to the 17th century we are covering this period. And in Northern Europe, the scholarly writings of Erasmus, the 37 complete plays of William Shakespeare, the poems of Edmund Spencer, Sir Philip Sidney, these are the important writers. Uh, they have the true Renaissance spirit in character, isn't it? And the literature of Renaissance was written within the general movement of the Renaissance that came into existence from the 13th century Italy and it continued till the 16th century Italy and uh, uh, it influenced the whole Western world. <laughs> And uh, the adoption of human philosophy, which I have already told you, and the recovery of the classical literature of antiquity, which was beneficial uh, for both literature and art. Those were the major factors of uh, the Renaissance literature. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the search for happiness, pleasure of the five senses, and the critical and rational spirit. It completed the ideological panorama of the Renaissance period. New literary journals, journals came into existence. Shakespearean sonnet and uh, Spenserian stanza. You already have read about those different kinds of sonnets and Shakespearean sonnet, which is so very important. 
So the key points that you have already discussed uh, in the previous lectures and little bit in today's discussion also are like in the 13th century, Italian authors began writing in that native I would uh, I would not like to use the language, vernacular word. I would say native languages, rather than only in Latin, French, or uh, Provencal. And you know, Provencal is a variety of four uh, Occitans spoken by a minority of people in the southern France, mostly in Provence. So, as I said, that even native languages, folk languages, were influential factors. The earliest Renaissance literature appeared in the 14th century Italy. I told you about Dante, Petrarch, and Machiavelli. From Italy, uh, it spread across Europe, and uh, uh, the, the adoption of humanitarian attitude or humanist philosophy, you have already discussed about it. And the Spenserian stanza uh, by Edmund Spencer, by his epic poem, The Fairy Queen, you have read this poem. And uh, the native languages or the vernacular languages, the introduction of the dialects, of a specific population. And the third and most important point for this, uh, maybe you get a question in your assignments. Believing in human beings. This is called anthropocentric. Anthropocentric, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. -E I think one of the lectures in this series is particularly about believing human beings, the anthropocentric approach. So this idea of literature was the major influential factor of renaissance art from that i will go to from anthropocentric ideas in literature or believing in human beings in literature i will go to the florence school of painting the florence school of painting became a dominant style during the renaissance period renaissance artworks that depicted more secular subjects more than the previous artistic movements. And Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Raphael, they are, uh, as I told you, they are the examples of the High Renunza. And uh, the High Renunza was followed by the Mannerist movement. And then uh, a kind of wall painting with color pigments, mixed color pigments, uh, water mixed with wet plaster. This new style of painting uh, came into existence. It's called fresco. It's called fresco. And as the plaster and pigments dry, they fuse together. And then, I mean, uh, there is an amalgamation between water and the wet plaster. There is an amalgamation. They dry together. And then the painting becomes a part of the wall itself. So Renanza artists, they introduced this kind of fresco. In India, you call it, you know, wall painting, graffiti, you say, but, but you don't use fresco. The, here, they use different colors. And uh, uh, next, you know, the, an Italian statesman, Lorenzo de' Medici, and uh, he was the de facto ruler of Florentine Republic. And uh, he was a patron of uh, Renanza art. Uh, patronage, encouragement, privilege, financial support to organizations mm -hmm. dealing with art and painting and to individuals, artists, was very important during this period. Uh, the Medici family, which we discussed, uh, they came to power in Florence. Their patronage and political support, you know, the political support to the artists was very important during that period. Even today, you'll see, we have so many institutions in different countries. You think about India. There are so many institutions. There are so many you know, organizations who provide financial and political support to different artists and the cultural movements. For any kind of full-fledged cultural movement, the support of the organizations, the government, and the ruling, the rulers, it's so important. This is not just happening today. It started in the Renaissance period, very much in the Renaissance period. Uh, the medicine wealth and influence, first, it was beneficial for the textile industry. 
and then uh, there was a guild named Ate Della Lana. It it had a financial superiority, and uh, the Medici family they dominated the city's government, and from textile industry, from fabrics, they came to art. And Medici patronage was responsibility responsible for majority of uh, uh, Florentine art, and. Uh, uh, None of the medicines themselves were scientists, but they also supported uh, scientists like uh, Galileo and, uh, and also uh, the, the multiple generations of medicine children, one after another. They not just supported artists, painters, they also supported scientists, Galileo Galilei, or they supported uh, Leonardo da Vinci, they supported a whole lot of painters, artists, and people of literature. Uh, having said that, uh, since we have been discussing so much about Renaissance art, uh, another key point uh, that I would touch upon today would be about Leonardo da Vinci's work. The innovative techniques, uh, as I already told you, and uh, his, uh, his very small portrait, you know, the, the size of Mona Lisa is very, very small. It's a very small portrait. It's not like the big portraits of Mona Lisa that you see in so many art galleries, they are actually the, uh, you know, the copied from the Renaissance, I mean, from the Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa's elusive smile. And, uh, uh, you know, the smile that cannot be determined, that cannot be understood, makes Leonardo da Vinci a prolific painter. And uh, the sculptor Michelangelo, he created his colossal marble statue, David, you can just Google the statue, David, you can see the, a, a, a single piece of marble, a huge, larger than life size uh, sculpture, you know, uh, the, the piece uh, called David, and it's a human being, the, the picture of a human, the, you know, the picture of a human being, and it's a single block of marble, and uh, the nude statue, of course, and uh, it established his prominence uh, that uh, he was an extraordinary sculptor with symbolic imagination. So this is another quality. You may get another question. Uh, uh, write something or write an overview of the symbolic imagination of the Renanza sculptors with special reference to Michelangelo. So look at this statue of marble, David. Uh, yesterday I was just looking at it on the internet and I zoomed it, I looked at it, and I looked at the eyebrows, the facial expression, the thoughtful expression of the statue, a faint smile, or sometimes I didn't find any smile on his face. So, you know, the, the face of David would actually change according to your mood. Whatever you are thinking, at least I felt so. What you are thinking, you would see that reflection on the face of David. Uh, in painting, Michelangelo is renowned uh, also for the ceiling art, the last judgment of the Sistine Chapel, uh, the ceiling, complete ceiling art. Now, when I talk about the influence of Renaissance on Indian art, you look at our temples, our churches, you look at our religious places, look at the ceiling, the, the, you know, the roof. The, the ceiling of uh, any of our religious places and you know cultural centers, ceiling art is so important. And the last judgment, even I saw that, I zoomed and looked at each picture minutely. He depicted a complex scheme. It's a very complex ceiling art. It represents the creation. Creation, Adam and Eve, the creation, how they ate the forbidden fruit and the creation came into being into existence and then the downfall of man the salvation of man and the genealogy of christ so many stories are depicted so the last judgment is a ceiling painting by michelangelo that actually depicts so many stories so story in painting this is where your creative imagination can go as a new historicist or as a cultural materialist that Renaissance painting was more about stories in painting. Renaissance literature was more about uh, painting in the form of stories. Painting in the sense of 
some symbolic imagination in the author's mind written on the black and white was renaissance literature and renaissance painting was stories in the painting and uh, michael angelo's major contribution to saint peter's basilica was about uh, uh, the use of a greek cross form and uh, also an external masonry of massive proportions it's a very massive painting big very big large and uh, it's filled in by a stairwell of small of, of you know small small pictures and uh, the 3d effect that it creates is continuous you look and look at it continuously look at it the 3d effect will be visible from the wall surfaces and uh, sometimes it will appear like fractured folded folded even at different angles so such complex such you know strange complex kind of painting they created and uh, uh, when you talk about uh, the renaissance artists like uh, you know michael angelo or leonardo da vinci uh, you have to know some key terms that the critics have been uh, using one is one term is you know contrapposto the spelling is c o n t r a p p o s t o contrapposto is the spelling but the pronunciation is like contrapposto uh, and the contrapposto technique that michael angelo uh, has mostly used in his uh, sculptures one is uh, uh, this david about which i was telling you the standing position of a human figure a tall human being standing tall broad shoulder standing tall and uh, most of the weight is placed on one foot see uh, i found it very interesting uh, that one foot takes all the weight of uh, uh, the the character i mean the, the figure and the other leg is relaxed so the effect of contrapposto in art in any kind of art it makes the figures look very naturalistic so naturalism also came from that they look very naturalistic now how do you stand suppose you are relaxed and you are standing at home and you are talking to your family members or friends how do you stand you will of course not stand upright both feet in the straight position you will not stand like that maybe the whole body would be you know the the, uh, the weight of the whole body would be on one leg and the other leg would be uh, relaxed relaxed kept on some chair some stool or maybe you know it's just somewhere uh so a natural look is there <coughs> and the best known chapel is uh, uh, you know the apostol palace and uh, now the artists who came a decade or more after raphael and michael angelo they had a dilemma see you know the uh, michael angelo and raphael kind of artists and leonardo da vinci kind of artists they set a standard so whoever came 10 years 15 years after them they had a moral dilemma while they were creating their arts they could not surpass they could not even match the great works that had been created by michael angelo raphael leonardo da vinci sort of masters of art arts so that is how the the ideas of mannerism emerged uh one of the uh, artists his name is jacopo da pontomo uh, 1494 to 1557 he was the first artist who represents the shift of the renaissance art to the mannerist styles so mannerism is a style of art in europe from 1520 to 1600 it came after uh, high renaissance and before the technique called baroque b a r o q u e these are the two techniques high renaissance and baroque between the two mannerism came and uh, every artist painting during this period need not be considered as a mannerist artist some of them had also other forms of uh, art which i will tell you but most of the artists between 1520 to 1600 they followed this kind of mannerism and uh, mm, okay now uh, let's go to florence and the renaissance so 
whenever you hear the term from any of your teacher, the term renunza when you hear, what comes to your mind? A kind of style of art? You are imagining a renunza style uh, that came from basically from Florence and, uh, and then through the Middle Ages, uh, Italy was divided into a number of different city-states, so city-states also should be discussed when you talk about Renaissance art. Each of the city-states had their own economy, their own artistic style, their own literature, culture, their own governance. And these things were also influential factors in the creation of the art and the literature of those periods. Naturally, isn't it? Uh, there were many different styles of art, architecture, and uh, you know, uh, Siena was a political supporter of France, and uh, you know, they retained a Gothic element in the art uh, during the period of Renaissance. Now, Gothic elements, supernatural elements, spirits, you know, those things you find in go to Shakespeare literature or Renaissance literature per se. Uh, go to so many fairy queen or go to uh, you know, uh, Macbeth, you, know, you go to uh, Hamlet or so many plays written during that period, you find some sort of supernatural elements in them. Uh, even if they were talking from uh, the, the palace paradigm, they were talking about the elites, uh, they were writing about the kings and monarchs only, but still there is a Gothic element in their writings. And you find that even in the art and painting, even in the sculpture, everything of the Renaissance period. And uh, this development of the Renaissance style in Florence uh, in the 15th century uh, became uh, the major fabric that drove humanism into Renaissance art. And uh, I already told you about the early Renaissance period. Uh, how the artists, they began to reject the Byzantine style of religious painting only. And uh, they decided to create a realism and allegory in their depiction of the human form. And uh, that their aim uh, was, uh, you know, to, to create perfect forms of art. And uh, during this early Renaissance period, I'll give you some of the examples. Uh, okay. Uh, the Medici house patronage, when I talk to you about uh, the Medici house patronage, they particularly, they specifically instructed and requested the artists to, uh, to you know, uh, to give importance, to emphasize the human form. And the biggest accomplishments of the Medici were the sponsorship of uh, uh, art and architecture uh, was, you know, their money. The, the creation of these fine pieces of art, like uh, uh, one of the fine pieces of art that I would uh, like you to uh, uh, to Google and check the, the painting is uh, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, in that, you know, well, just let me give you the name of that painting. Yeah, the, the name of the painting is Fra Angelico. Uh, you know, the, the associates were Donatello and Fra Angelico. And, uh, uh, you know, the, in the beginning of that period, uh, they introduced this style of painting where animals, human beings, kings, and monarchs, everybody in one piece of painting, different, different parts of the painting, uh, so many uh, characteristics, so many you know, mannerisms and uh, uh, so many logical and illogical spaces and elongated figures, human beings, they are like, like very tall and very elongated figures. So different kinds of phenomena were incorporated into one piece of painting. And uh, uh, when you talk about a new historicist approach, to the paintings of that period, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was the ultimate Renaissance man. He practiced all the visual art forms. He studied wide range of topics like anatomy, geology, botany, and flight, and literature, art, and painting. And his formidable reputation is 
of course, on his paintings, including the Mona Lisa and the Virgin of the Rocks and the Last Supper kind of paintings. But then he was truly interdisciplinary. So that is how I said that in the paintings, you will find different kinds of things, elongated human figures, animals, supernatural beings, and then daily life of human beings, and then the flora and fauna. Everything taken together would be visible in one painting by Leonardo da Vinci kind of Renaissance artist. So this is what I have been telling you that read parallelly. Read the literary texts of that period and then look at the paintings of the great masters like Leonardo da Vinci. You can make a comparative analysis. Uh, in the later part of the 14th century, the proto renaissance period was shifted by plague and war and it was uh, uh, and its influence did not emerge until the next century in 1401, which is early 15th century. Uh, there was an artist, the sculptor Lorenzo Ghibetti. He won a major competition to design a new set of bronze doors for the uh, Cathedral of Florence. So you know, there were competitions. Artists were asked to compete with each other to design a bronze door. So he owned that competition. The name of the artist is Lorenzo Givati. Uh, and then uh, he defeated so many of his contemporaries like Brunesci and then uh, the, another artist, Donatello. And uh, then he emerged as a master of early Renaissance sculpture. And see, uh, the, the later, in the later part, uh, in the major period of Renaissance or in the high Renaissance period artists, were so very influenced by this artist, Lorenzo Giverti. And uh, the other major artist working during uh, this period was the pent another painter, Macasio. I think he was from 1401 to 1428. Such a short span he lived, but he painted so much. Uh, he created so many art pieces. And uh, he is remembered for uh, the Trinity that he created in the Church of Santa Maria Novella and uh, in the you know, Branchiasi Chapel of the Church of Santa Maria, everything in Florence. And uh, he painted only for six years or less than that. But then he was highly influential uh, for the early Renaissance artists, uh, for the intellectual nature of his work. And uh, he introduced naturalism like I have been emphasizing, that you look at the paintings and the pieces of art of uh, Renaissance period, you see naturalism, common man, humanity, humanism, and then uh, a, a queer amalgamation of the flora and fauna. You find everything in, in the uh, pieces of art. Uh, now, from 1434 to 1494, when Lorenzo de Medici, he was known as the magnificent for his leadership and for his support of the art, he died. And uh, uh, the powerful family, Lorenzo family, they presided over a golden age uh, in the city of Florence. And uh, then later on, they were pushed out from power by a Republican coalition in the later part of the 15th century, maybe towards the end of 15th century, they were pushed out of power. And then the Medici family, they spent six years in hiding, in exile. But again, they returned. In the early part of 16th century, they, they came back to uh, power. And then they presided over another uh, period of uh, very important Florentine art, including uh, so many artists, sculptures. And uh, those pieces of art are there even today. In the, in the Western world. And when we talk to you about the high Renaissance period, high Renaissance art, uh, by the end of the 15th century, Rome had uh, displaced Florence as the provincial center of Renaissance art. And uh, the high point under, uh, I mean, uh, the, the most powerful ruler of this period, the ambitious ruler of this period was Pope Leo X. And uh, the, th the three important masters about whom we have been constantly discussing, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael, they were under Pope Leo X. And uh, they dominated uh, this period of the high renaissance. 
and uh, it uh, this period lasted from early 1490s to uh, say 1500 uh, mid not even mid towards 1530 this period was over leonardo da vinci his period was 1452 say 1519 he was the ultimate renaissance man isn't it and his intellect his his multiculturalism his interdisciplinary approach like he was an expert of medicine art literature painting and everything and his multiple interests his expression of humanism and of the classical values they make leonardo da vinci unique and uh, like i already discussed a lot about mona lisa he took two years to paint it 1503 to 1505 and the virgin of the rock he painted that in 1400 85 and then uh, in the fresco style he he painted the last supper uh, about the last supper of jesus christ before he went for the crucifixion uh, the last supper he painted between 90, uh, 1495 to 1498 these things showcase his uh, ability to portray uh, light and dark colors natural colors together and uh, you know the, the 3d sort of painting and uh, new techniques and uh, the physical relationships between the figures human beings animals and objects and also the landscape everything taken together leonardo da vinci and uh, michelangelo or his period was 1475 to 1564 so they were almost contemporaries uh, and he drew on the human body. He made so many human statues, human body for inspiration. And he created his works majorly. He was a dominant sculptor of the High Renaissance period. And uh, his important pieces are the Pieta and the St. Peter's Cathedral and the David. I am a big fan of his David uh, in, his, uh, in, in Florence. And he carved the letter by hand. See, they did it not by any machine. They did everything by hand from marble blocks, single marble pieces. He created it. And the famous statue, it, it measures five meters high, including its base, so as high as the real human beings. And uh, Michelangelo considered himself a, a sculptor first. And then uh, later on, he also painted. He was also a painter. And uh, with his uh, giant fresco covering the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he completed over four years and, and, and depicted different scenes from the Genesis. And uh, Raphael Senzio, uh, the youngest of the three great uh, high renaissance masters, he was inspired by both, Raphael was inspired by both Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. You know, his paintings, uh, most important paintings are the School of Athens that he did between 2000, sorry, 1508 to 1511. And uh, he painted in the Vatican City. Uh, and uh, again, he, uh, when Michelangelo was working on the Sistine chapels, uh, this uh, Raphael was working on, on similar kind of, uh, you know, wall paintings and uh, ceiling paintings. He was majorly influenced by him. And uh, Renata art was in practice uh, not just among these three artists. There were many other artists and uh, who created religious images. And uh, they painted subjects like the Virgin Mary or Madonna. They named it as the Madonna, Virgin Mary. And uh, they were encountered by audiences of the period uh, during the religious rituals, even, you know, artists were questioned by people. It's not just that the artists who would paint something and they can, you know, get away with their own ideas. Uh, they were questioned. And uh, even today, they are viewed as great works of art. And uh, at that point of time, they were just devotional objects. But today, we look at those as tourists, as lovers of art. And uh, Renanza works were painted as rituals at that point uh, for the Catholic mass. Uh, but 
today uh, they are influential factors for the world art culture architecture and painting and also literature and the renaissance artists they came from all sections of the society you know uh, they were scientists they were medicine men uh, they were aristocrats they were common people they were influenced by the great masters and they they took themes like marriage childbirth everyday life of the family so this is the major point of distinction between uh, the the high and the low culture the so called high and low culture during the renaissance period that mostly in renaissance literature you will find the high culture i put it within quote quote and quote high culture which in folkloristic uh, in the folklore research you call that margi and desi high and low so margi is the high culture desi is the low culture in indian folkloristic and in western art form you will find high and low so in the literature you mostly find the high culture the kings the monarchs the majors and the rich people and in the in the paintings in the sculpture in the art pieces of art you find common people with their everyday life you get rituals like marriage childbirth death and everything so i can take the risk of saying that uh, renaissance paintings renaissance art was much more broader than renaissance literature you may challenge me on that uh, you may question me on that but by looking at both renaissance literature and renaissance art somehow as a person of literature being a person of literature i still feel that renaissance art were, had a broader theme than renaissance literature correct me if i am wrong uh everything that sees a you know a pinnacle of glory it has to decline some day or other renaissance period had an expansion during the high renaissance and it had its decline and uh, well one of uh, the paintings the last supper which i told you we just google that picture and see how mother mary is sitting and you know some children one of them is jesus christ and they all are having the last supper and uh, uh, leonardo da vinci's most celebrated painting this one uh, the last supper uh, it was painted for the refectory of the convent of santa maria uh, you know uh, della grazia in milan and uh, this is the last meal the last food the supper shared by uh, jesus christ and the 12 apostles uh, and while having the supper the, the most important point of uh, this painting is I, while having food the supper with the 12 apostles jesus christ uh, you know non challengingly in a detached mode he announces that one of those 12 people will betray him one of those 12 people will betray him even that is reflected in the painting if you read the story the bible and you look at this picture you can actually connect the two and uh, once it was finished the painting was acclaimed as a masterpiece of design you know and uh, the, this work demonstrated something that uh, leonardo da vinci did very well taking a common a traditional subject matter like like the last supper and then he reinvented it so there can be another question for your assignment that how did the renaissance artists and the painters and the sculptors they reinvented the art pieces they, they reinvented the art not pieces they reinvented the art they added meaning to it you know they took stories from the bible they took stories from the common life everyday life and they reinvented those recreated those they translated those into their pieces of art by giving some additional meanings to those and how did they do that of course by the body language of their subjects the body language the facial expression the eyes if you just zoom any of this renaissance uh, paintings you zoom and look at the eyes of those figures you will feel they are so close to life as if they are alive they are looking at you they will wink now you feel like that 
one piece that I looked at yesterday was the Last Supper, and I would say it has a visual tradition. It it looks so visual. the The picture will talk to you. The picture will actually speak to you. And uh, the Lord, you know, Jesus Christ and the apostles, they are seated at a table, and uh, Judas is placed on the opposite side of the table. Uh, of everybody else, so one person is at the opposite side of everybody else, and uh, you know the viewer can easily identify that one person is the opposite side. So when Leonardo da Vinci painted this and he placed Judas on the same side of the table as Christ and the apostles, uh, you can react that uh, how Jesus Christ is going to announce that one of them will betray him. and they are depicted they are painted with the face the, the faces of the the uh, the you know some subjects they look alarmed they look upset and uh, they are trying to find out who will commit the act of betraying jesus christ who will betray so there is a question in their in their eyes of the uh, the painting of all the pictures of all the figures in the painting all the 12 apostles their eyes are questioning isn't it so so very critical and complex that there are questions in their eyes and they are depicted and you know uh, uh, leonardo da vinci has kind of uh, introduced psychology psychology into the art human psychology into the art and it's so difficult in fact after the renaissance art renaissance paintings i failed to find this kind of facial expression in any other uh paintings of any other period and uh, but unfortunately like i said uh, every piece of art or every form of art has a period of deterioration so this masterpiece of uh, the last supper this masterpiece it started deteriorating uh very uh, immediately after uh, the painting was done Uh, due to the painting technique he had chosen he did not use fresco that i said the 3d painting sort of he didn't use that fresco technique he used tempera tempera was another technique over a ground and uh, he tried to bring a strong and a subtle effect of oil painting to fresco and uh, this technique that he experimented it was not successful and it resulted in uh, flaking and molding of the piece of art so next what he did in the mona lisa he tried to improve upon that it is a very small portrait of the 16th century and the mona lisa is otherwise also known as the la gioconda uh, it the meaning the laughing one mona lisa is laughing smiling frowning i really don't know what whenever i look at the mona lisa i just look at it i just look at her why am i saying it i look at her and i ask myself is she laughing or frowning or angry or sad or she is in love or what i am not able to understand hmm. so this is what was the intention of uh, the artist and uh, particularly uh, mona lisa is different uh, because of its mysterious quality and also he used a shadowy quality for this art uh like i said uh, no sumato technique he used uh, layers of uh, transcurrent paints and uh, there is a visible transition of colors tones so you look at the skin tone of the mona lisa the her skin tone looks different from any painting that you will see and uh, another most important characteristic of uh, the mona lisa is um, you know there is a dramatic dramatic landscape at the background the world seems to be uh, confused you know you look at the background of mona lisa you will feel that everyone is confused the whole world is confused lot of flux there and uh, also it has an extremely smooth texture you feel like it's a real human skin yeah. mona lisa skin looks like real human skin and uh, he employs oil painting of course and uh, uh, so much like the tempera uh, 
and the brush strokes are very hazy not very clear not very loud and clear but hazy and uh, leonardo da vinci he innovated uh, some kind of painting here and uh, in renaissance period people had this fashion of painting uh, the figures the faces of women uh, women were always in the profile not in the profile pics in the profile of the painters the artists of the renaissance period and uh, it was a very proper and modest kind of a painting of course and uh, uh, you know da, da vinci created mona lisa as a woman a mystery woman with a very realistic skin tone texture tenor and uh, she not only faces you suppose if you are if you are looking at the mona lisa she is actually looking back she is looking at you so that technique was not there before leonardo da vinci now if you click a pic you click your picture you look at the camera and in the picture your eyes will actually look at you so that kind of profile of a portrait leonardo da vinci created through the mona lisa mona lisa will follow you through her eyes you place the painting in the center of the hall and you go to any corner of the hall the painting will actually look at you so she will follow you and this technique i found uh, something really uh, very very intriguing something very mysterious and uh, when i talk about the mona lisa how can i miss talking about the david michael angelo uh, was a florentine artist i have been repeatedly telling him you about him and his architectural designs were so very different and uh, the last judgment the david and the basilica of saint peter uh, these are his creations and about david you know uh, he was commissioned like i said that the kings and the mona the rich families they used to uh, patronize they were the patrons of art and the michael angelo was a commissioned art piece uh, he was uh, you know in fact uh, assigned to create a colossal marble statue uh, portraying david as a symbol of uh, the freedom freedom of florence florentine freedom like you look at the statue of liberty today uh, and uh, this statue david stands for florentine freedom and uh, it it established uh, michael angelo's prominence as a sculptor of extraordinary technical skills and uh, a single marble block larger than life originally intended to adorn the florence cathedral but later on it was shifted and how david is different unique from the other representations of, of that period is uh, you know he is uh, uh, you know he is it's it's, a, it's standing victorious over the head of golets no other florentine artist has created this kind of uh, an a piece of art uh, i told you about contraposto is it in the renaissance period uh, the contraposto is a dynamic three dimensional pose of the human form in which some parts of the body twist against other now if you look at david david is standing tall but he is looking the other side looking not looking at you but looking at the side other side and uh, the realistic elements sir there are even veins the bulge out from his right hand body is relaxed contraposto pose uh, like the the weight of the body is on one foot and the other foot is slightly relaxed and uh, it's a typical pose a distinctive feature of uh, the antique sculpture uh, david and uh, the last judgment is uh, a painting michael angelo uh, he is renowned for this work in the sistine chapel i already told you that the ceiling the painting of the ceiling and uh, it's the altar wall of the sistine chapel and uh, it was commissioned by the pope clement uh 8 7 okay 
and uh, he did hard work on that. I think uh, for seven years he painted it, uh, and uh, till today it is there. And uh, the Last Judgment uh, is much more about the artificial poses and uh, the mannerist style. You know, the mannerists took ideas from the Last Judgment. They could not exactly follow the three great masters of uh, other Renaissance, but uh, they took some ideas uh, from this Last Judgment. And uh, it's the, the background is blue, light blue, and uh, different, different varieties of things, like somebody is sitting in the center, somebody is crying, somebody is touching somebody, and nude, mostly nude, uh, semi-nude uh, pictures, which give you a very realistic picture. And uh, another architecture was St. Peter's Basilica, which uh, Michelangelo is one of the chief contributions. And uh, it was a symmetrical plan of a Greek cross. And uh, it's, it's very, very beautiful. I would uh, suggest that you should go and uh, look at the internet for that. So, uh, and uh, the mannerism came after this high renaissance period and it continued for quite some time. And a lot of artists and like Jacopo da Pontomo and uh, so many other artists, uh, they... They created the mannerism and the art, you know, the pieces that belong to the mannerist painting style. And the colors are far from naturalistic here, unlike the Renanza art. And uh, Renanza artists would not have produced these kind of artists, but uh, the mannerist movement traces different goals. Its ideas are different. Uh, maybe in another lecture, I can talk to you about uh, the mannerist style if. Uh, they permit me. Now, in the beginning, I had told you that uh, I will also tell you a little bit about uh, the impact of Renanza art on Indian art forms. Uh, though it's not a part of the lecture, but I'm tempted to say that. Uh, the Indian art of painting uh, had almost died in the 19th century, isn't it? Even the Indians had accepted their inferiority in art and painting. Okay? And then late E.B. Hagel, he is the head of uh, Calcutta School of Art, uh, along with his uh, fellow colleague and fellow artist, Abhinindranath Tagore. Uh, he introduced, he started uh, teaching beauty and art in Indian uh, cultural centers. And uh, his, he openly accepted that uh, Renansa art was his uh, influence. He was influenced by the Renansa art in the early 19th century. And uh, once they took inspiration from the Renanza art and began teaching and painting uh, once again, and the world began to recognize the significance and the richness of Indian art. And uh, Tagore was uh, regarded as a creative artist. You know him. He was the soul of India uh, to the world. And uh, in France, you know, in the Paris, there was an exhibition organized for Tagore School of Painting. And in the Tagore School of Painting, uh, there was so much of comparative study, comparative analysis between Renansa art and uh, Tagore's art. I mean, Renansa art and uh, the art of uh, India, Abhinindana Tagore and uh, all other Indians like, you know, uh, Devi Prasad Chaudhary, M. A. Rahman, and uh, Chuktai, and the Sharda Charan Ukkil, Mukul Chandra De, and uh, Amrita Shergil. Who doesn't know Amrita Shergil? So, their pieces of art, their paintings were exhibited in that exhibition where there was a lot of discussion, seminars, conferences, lectures on the comparative study between the Renaissance art and the Indian art. And today you look at the paintings of M. F. Hussain, Mali, B. D. Chichalkar, Abhani Sen, Kamala Das Gupta, lot of Indians, uh, you find that uh, their art pieces are influenced by uh, the, the Renanza art. So uh, before I conclude, I would just give you the, the major qualities of uh, Renanza art. Uh, one is Impressionism. And uh, I told you a little bit about uh, Impressionism. Next is, uh, you know, modern art forms, how Renaissance art was 
an influential factor of the modern art forms and then romanticism you know romanticism of renaissance literature was reflected in the romanticism of renaissance art and then another characteristic of renaissance art is abstract art you know not just concrete abstract art forms and uh, and then uh, you know uh, the importance was given to the artist and uh, historical analysis of facts and uh, you know different periods and uh, modernist techniques imperialism was found in the renaissance art and then structural functionalism and then uh, social issues was found in renaissance art and uh, gothic architecture like i already discussed about the supernatural qualities and the gothic qualities of uh, renaissance art and uh, uh, another quality is uh, you know uh, the renaissance art i already i have told you that uh, use of uh, fresh subdued human colors something that michael angelo used for the mona lisa and to give them a real life like quality so with this i would stop here and if you have any questions or anything or anything to comment or anything to suggest please come forward or maybe we can stop here thank you ma'am basu i can't hear you hello am i audible now yes yes please thank you ma'am you did that without a single break though you said that you would be taking break i'm going to it was spell binding we were all mesmerized by the flow in which you gave us the lecture thank you so much for managing all this despite your help so uh, students do we have questions it has been one wonderful session and i can realize that you may not have uh, just a Bashu, unmute KJ. You need to unmute Bashu once again. I think some child is there, so she has muted herself. Yeah. yeah. Now working from home has its own. Yes. Yes. And. Uh, Yes so uh, this has been one very interesting session where i can understand that students must have been so spellbound as we were all by the flow of the lecture that we did not have time for a critical analysis but yes questions are coming in one by one and we will not ask too many questions because we do not want to tax you further you have already spoken a lot today uh, nevertheless we can take a couple of questions with your permission Yeah, of course. And Vasudha, I would suggest that send, email me all the questions. I'll answer to all the questions. Now, just give me one or two. Sure, 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 ma'am. Yes. Email. I will reply my mails. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we can just begin with a couple of light questions. Um, uh, Priyanka Das asks that uh, she she is asking about Michelangelo and his paintings, and she's also asking for which painting was Raphael given the highest award. uh the blood crown uh you mm -hmm. could kind of throw light on this this is a question about which i am not very certain uh nevertheless mm -hmm. mm, for no, which even rough, yeah you, even the you, highest award like the blood crown okay you send me the question i have to do some research and find out sure and sure yes even i i uh, some questions may not be very pertinent to the lecture yeah. that is Yeah. Uh, come up. Uh, okay, here is Arjunas was asking, what was the general status of artists in Renaissance society? In fact, very good because they were patronized. They were not struggling. Any good artist was recognized and patronized. They had all kinds of support, intellectual, social, and financial support. They had a very good position. yes so renaissance uh, art uh, you know it, it comes from the kind of society that uh, gave birth to the renaissance because nothing would have been possible as uh, ma'am points out rightly without social support and patronage so we will keep to this today we will not uh, disturb uh, ma'am uh, or tax her <laughs> i enjoyed i thoroughly enjoyed i felt good 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, over to Yaya sir, you know, for his comments on this wonderful session. Yeah, Dr. Yaya. Uh, no, no, not comments, ma'am. We are extremely delighted to have you here. And uh, yeah, uh, I personally knew that you are an expert in literature, you are an expert in folklore. But the way you talked upon about the art today, uh, that was really a very new thing for me. This is what I am asking, saying about myself. It was a very yeah. new experience for me. Yeah. And the most beautiful thing of your lecture, from my point of view, was the way you associated uh, that lecture with Indian art. And you referred to all those Mughal painters coming down to even the contemporary painters like M.F. Hussain and all that. Yeah. So that was a very unique way of associating and trying to convince the students that this is how we can do the studies. This is how we should rather do the studies. When you are a student of literature, you need not look at literature only. There are other ways, there are other art forms, there are several other things that you should take into consideration when you are looking at or you are studying literature. So it was a very nice, very enriching, and very delighting lecture, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much you for your you. for your. And, may, and, may, I, may I inform something here, Dr. Yahya? So, yeah, uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. I, yeah, yeah, Dr. Yahya is he is collaborating with me to design the MA in Folklore and Culture Studies, and he is writing a chapter for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Right. Bashudra, we may go ahead to the vote of thanks. Please. Yes, so we have many, many appreciative comments in the chat box. I will just uh, cite Rajeshree's recent comment where she says that this was one of the most graphical lectures that she had attended. And indeed, I think that brings out uh, the best, you know, it's a word that brings out the best of the lecture. Because when you were very ekfrast, the way you were talking about art almost evoked the art pieces in front of us. And with yeah, yes, sir, when he says that very few people would have been able to bring about this confluence of literature and art and you have done absolute justice to this session today thank you so much for your kindness for your commitment uh for you know, not taking uh you know the to have cancelled the session which you might have easily done thank you so much for joining us for send me the recording i would like to have the recording please definitely oh. definitely yeah. Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And very soon. So all the best to all of you. Namaskar.